The WNBA has long embraced the LGBT community, both on the court and in the stands. But starting this week, it will become the first professional sports league to have a marketing campaign specifically targeting those fans. And for us, it's really um, a celebration of diversity and inclusion and a recognition of an audience that has been with us um, very passionately. The league's WNBA Pride campaign will focus on print and the web. The WNBA is a league where women show off their elite athletic talents. It attracts the best players in the world, despite offering much lower pay than teams overseas. Watching the W means watching basketball played by some of the best in the world. But sports are about more than just watching the game. They're about the personalities and narratives that emerge from competition. The moments that go down in history aren't necessarily about peak performance, but about telling stories, the dynasty builders, the underdogs, the teams overcoming their rivals or clawing back from a 3-1 deficit in a final series, the players whose personalities are larger than life. One thing that sets the WNBA apart from men's sports league in the U.S. is that these narratives are often about queer women. The WNBA has a lot to offer in terms of lesbian representation. It's full of out and proud queer women of all kinds, including some of the greatest players to ever grace the league. There are two gay goats, Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird are the best of all time, who are heading into their 20th and 21st seasons in the league, respectively. There have been queer MVPs like John Quill Jones, Cheryl Swoops, Elena Deladon, Brianna Stewart, Diana Taurasi, and Candace Motherflipping Parker. It has extremely cool gay couples, extremely uncool gay couples, vocal leaders like Laisha Clarendon, a team led by a married couple, the Chicago Sky's Courtney Vandersloot and Allie Quigley just won the championship. Half of the Connecticut Suns players are out, and their coach Kurt Miller is the only out gay male coach in U.S. pro sports. And they have drama. Player Dewana Bonner left her wife, Candace Dupree, a player on another team, for Alyssa Thomas, who's her current teammate. And while these aren't technically queer things, I just feel the need to mention that former MVP Sylvia Fowles has trained for a post-playing career as a mortician, and another former MVP, Maya Moore, got a wrongfully convicted man freed from jail and then married him. Your favorite male athlete just doesn't have this kind of range. We are dedicating this season to Brianna Taylor, an outstanding EMT who was murdered over 130 days ago in her home. The W is also a league that has embraced and celebrated activism for racial justice. In the summer of 2020, as protests over police violence and racial justice were happening across the country, the WNBA was mostly in the Wubble, the contained ecosystem where the COVID season was held for safety. Despite this, players insisted on making statements, dedicating games to Breonna Taylor, canceling games, and taking time on ESPN to grieve the shooting of Jacob Blake. This activism would take its most visible form when players began an open rebellion against Kelly Loeffler, a part owner of the Atlanta Dream franchise and a Republican candidate for senator in Georgia. Loeffler openly antagonized players, criticizing their activism and denigrating racial justice protesters and the Black Lives Matter movement. When the Seattle Storm and the Dream were set to play, Storm star Sue Bird came up with an idea, Vote Warnock shirts, promoting Loeffler's opponent. The Storm got on board, and so did the players of the Atlanta Dream, who showed up to the game visibly calling out their own ownership. Eventually, five teams in total would embrace the Vote Warnock message. Loeffler would go on to lose to Reverend Warnock later that year. I should say up front that I am kind of the wrong person to be doing this history. I'm a bisexual white guy. These aren't necessarily my stories to tell. But right now, there's a dearth of WNBA content on YouTube. While countless channels go into depth on the men's game, the WNBA often gets short shrift. Outside of a few great videos from Secret Base, links in the description, there are generally two types of videos on here. Games and highlights, which are great, but mostly for those who are already fans, and videos by sad men who feel the need to tell WNBA fans that the league is less popular than the men's league and makes less money. As if WNBA fans don't already know that. Missing from this mix is the stories of the league, the history that more recent fans weren't around for. 
But thankfully, the fan base is continuing to grow, and it's a fan base that embraces the league in part because of the outspokenness of so many players as black and or queer women. On issues of race, sexuality, gender, and labor, WNBA players are creating a league that is progressive, inclusive, and outspoken, and that's largely unprecedented in professional sports. Sports have always been political. Jesse Owens, Jackie Robinson, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, Muhammad Ali, Babe Diedrichson, Billie Jean King, Colin Kaepernick. What makes the WNBA different is the way that these values are broadly shared and expressed by the player base. In the past, so many of these figures stood alone, them against the world. What I see in the WNBA is a player base that mostly stands together. For those of you who clicked on this based on the words queer history, I hope you'll check out a game if you're someone who, like me, had a pretty negative relationship with sports growing up. WNBA games are incredibly fun, and if you're in or near a city with a franchise, I highly encourage you to attend one. You might just discover you like sports more than you thought. What we're here to talk about is the queer history of the WNBA. And while we are lucky to live in a time where athletes can openly express who they love and how they present, that wasn't always the case. Sue Wicks, the New York Liberty's number one draft pick in the inaugural WNBA draft and the league's first out lesbian player, had a front row seat to that evolution. In an interview reflecting on the first couple decades of the WNBA, Wicks said, There had been a lot of thought about how they were going to sell the league to the middle of America. They wanted to appeal to everybody, and in that was family values. I wouldn't say it was subtle, because every advertisement featured family in the stands. They showcased the girls that had husbands or kids or other family ties. And it certainly was a true representation. It's one facet of the league, and it was the one that they were selling then. Fast forward, I was watching one of the first televised WNBA drafts after I retired. One player that was chosen had on a three-piece suit, and her hair was short. She was such a beautiful human being, because she was 100% authentic. She was sitting in herself. This kid took my breath away. You could see the pride she had in the way she walked across the stage. For our first dive into WNBA's queer history, we're going to look at the early years of the league in the late 90s and early 2000s, and the ways in which the early WNBA built a glass closet for queer players and fans. When the WNBA was launched in 1996, the conversation in the U.S. about LGBTQ issues was very different. For one, we weren't talking about LGBTQ issues then. We were mostly talking about what were called gay issues. And we were especially obsessed with the concept of the closet. Who was in it? Who was coming out? Just before the 90s dawned, Eve kosofsky Sedgwick published her classic, The Epistemology of the Closet. For Sedgwick, the closet provides a metaphor and lens through which to view a number of texts, but also contemporary society more broadly. Borrowing from Foucault, Cedric is less interested in what's explicitly said and instead attempts to theorize what's missing. While most theory focuses on knowledge and active speech acts, Cedric attends to ignorance and silence as central facts of the closet. Because, as Cedric writes, closetedness itself is a performance initiated by the speech act of a silence. Not a particular silence, but a silence that accrues particularity by fits and starts in relation to the discourse that surrounds and differentially constructs it. In other words, silence and ignorance aren't a lack of knowledge, but a part of knowledge. Closetedness is defined by the pieces that are left out of what's explicitly said, because it's a framework for keeping and or disclosing something secret about oneself. Homology of the Closet was written in the 1980s and published in 1990, a time when much of gay life was defined by the HIV epidemic, which energized homophobic politics at the same time that countless members of the gay community were dying. By the mid-90s, things were changing in the US, Public health officials were taking the disease seriously, new treatments and more widespread testing were brought online, and a focus on early aggressive treatment extended the lifespan of many HIV patients by decades. HIV was by no means solved in the mid-90s. It continued to ravage marginalized communities and countries without access to the resources and therapies that were improving patient outcomes for some. But as the number of new cases began to decline in the U.S., discussions about queer issues focused less on a public health crisis and more on coming out, or being outed. George Michael, Ellen DeGeneres, Anne Heche, Rosie O'Donnell, Nathan Lane, K.D. Lang, Melissa Etheridge, Neil Patrick Harris, and countless other queer celebrities stepped out of the closet in the late 90s and early 2000s, and these were often huge stories. This is the environment in which the WNBA launched. 
And from the beginning, the league was acutely aware of perceptions around women athletes, gender, and sexuality. When the NBA was moving to launch the league, they contracted with Lisa Leslie as its public face, someone who is an elite player, a sometimes model, and visibly publicly straight. The league highlighted players who were conventionally attractive, who conformed to norms of femininity, and most often, who were white. The public face the WNBA wanted to broadcast wasn't that this was a diverse league of badass women breaking down barriers. Instead, they focused on sanding off the aspects of the league and the lives of players that might complicate their project of projecting conventional, straight femininity as part of the WNBA package. So, you want to see my Discover Card statement? I am very, very prissy. Put up or shut up! I love to be pampered. I go have my hair done. I love to go have my nails done, have pedicures, manicures. My biggest weakness would have to be shoes. Hmm. The result was a kind of don't ask, don't tell policy, one which then president of the LA Sparks, Johnny Buss, articulated to the LA Times. What I've learned over all the years, you're just better off being blind to certain lifestyles. We've discussed homosexuality in the NBA and WNBA. We don't ask. If you look at the general population, you could come up with statistics on who is homosexual and who is not. I don't know why that would be any different in professional sports. Now, it's one of these things that people won't come out and disclose. I think they should. I know there's a lot of prejudice in America, and it's sickening to me. This quote perfectly captures the contradictory nature of the early WNBA's approach to queerness. On the one hand, it's meant to be left unspoken. We don't ask, implying that the league is uninterested. Then, it moves to a sort of apologetics, denying that there would be any reason for queer women to be overrepresented in the WNBA. Then finally, after this confusing and ambivalent denialism, a nod towards the need for acceptance. However, in the same piece where this statement ran, a Sparks player named Latasha Byers revealed that the team's comms director had told her not to speak to gay and lesbian publications and to be careful about which club she went to. Michelle Van Gorp, one of the earliest out WNBA players, said that when she played for the New York Liberty, discussions of homosexuality were considered taboo. While the early WNBA had an informal don't ask, don't tell policy, the presence of queer people, and especially lesbians, among both players and fans was readily apparent. The silence on homosexuality was a reaction to societal homophobia in general, and specifically to widespread stereotypes of women in sports as unfeminine and unstraight. For some straight women, this defense of their womanhood may have felt like a relief, pushing back against stereotypes. For queer players, especially those who were more outspoken, or those who presented as less conventionally feminine, this was a trap and an insult. The implicit message of the WNBA's communications, as well as its silences, was that they were people the public didn't want to see, and that the ideal player or fan didn't look, act, or love the way that they did. The glass closet was the term Sandra Coburn and Jason Levin used to describe this situation when they wrote about it for the LA Times in 2005. And it's an apt metaphor, as the WNBA employed closeting as both an active and passive strategy despite the growing visibility of queerness among players, fans, and society in general. While the powers that be continued to try and keep things in the closet, there was growing resistance among lesbian fans, who wanted the league to acknowledge their outsized role in supporting the W. In 2002, this resistance was put on dramatic display by a group of lesbian New York Liberty fans under the banner Lesbians for Liberty. Slighted by the Liberty's systematic refusal to acknowledge lesbian fans, they issued a public statement, asking, Are you tired of the WNBA and the New York Liberty denying that lesbians are packing Madison Square Garden week after week for women's basketball games? Lesbians for Liberty weren't asking for much. They simply wanted the Liberty to promote Gay Pride Days in the same positive ways that they promoted Father's Day or Black History Month. They fought back with a protest they dubbed the Time Out Kissin, during a nationally televised Liberty game, a large group of women in the stands would engage in a coordinated kissing campaign, making their love and their queerness visible to all. Sue Wicks, who played for the Liberty at the time, explained the feelings of these lesbian fans in a 2020 interview. They were doing the kissing to identify themselves because they felt they weren't represented. When they showed the crowd on the Jumbotron, they felt that the cameras were trying to paint a different picture of who was in attendance at the game, rather than acknowledging that lesbians made up a big part of the fan base. Even if they had just made up a fraction of the fan base, you want to represent your fans and show them all. I heard many times that they felt the camera avoided them, so much so that it seemed intentional. The protest got attention. The Liberty responded with an anodyne PR statement about treating all fans equally. The very male, very straight sports press was not particularly swayed by the protest. New York Times sports columnist Ian Burkow wrote, 
Your personal or private business is your own. Lead any life you like as long as I can lead mine and you don't try to foist yours on me. A good citizen is a good citizen is a good citizen, regardless of age, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. And so if a business wants to cater to a particular group, gay or otherwise, that is its business. When you saw Greg Luganis dive, you thought, great dive, not great gay dive. And when you see a WNBA point guard make a spectacular drive, you don't think, great gay drive. Who cares? Who needs to? And that is as it should be. The sports press was more than happy with the WNBA's organizational don't ask, don't tell strategy. The straight men covering sports for daily newspapers had no interest in tackling societal hot topics that they had no stake in. As long as queer players' sexuality was bracketed out, that was, quote, as it should be. The presumption of heterosexuality and the closet could do the necessary work of setting queerness aside. Sue Wicks and Michelle Van Gorp are credited as the first two WNBA players to come out as lesbians. The thing is, neither of them was ever really in the closet. It's just that nobody had bothered to ask. While Wicks didn't come out publicly until 2002, she had already publicly undermined the straight family values image that the league sought to project two years earlier. In a 2000 Village Voice profile, she made a small attempt to shatter the glass of the league's closet. Wicks is one of the few players willing to discuss the league's squeamishness about lesbians. I can't say how many players are gay, notes Wicks, but it would be easier to count the straight ones. It's pretty clear from this interview that Wicks wasn't putting any particular effort into being closeted. It almost reads like she was walking the interviewer right up to the line and waiting for it to be crossed. When she did come out in 2002, she acknowledged her concern that it would overshadow her team and her as a player. While there was a minor reaction in the sports press, she declined additional interviews and the story mostly passed by in a press cycle more concerned with rumors about Mets catcher Mike Piazza's sexuality. Van Gorp, who officially came out in a 2004 interview with the LGBTQ publication Lavender Magazine, was similarly nonchalant about the whole thing. Her relationship with her wife was already out in the open. In a piece by Outsports looking back on her coming out, Jim Bozinski writes, Van Gorp has never hid her orientation and has taken her partner Kyleen to team events both with the Lynx and previously with the Liberty. The Lynx media guide mentions Kyleen as her spouse. But apparently, the Lavender was the first publication to ask Van Gorp about being gay and she didn't hesitate to respond. Van Gorp's interview also bolstered the Lesbians for Liberty's case against the franchise. She said that her then-current team, the Minnesota Lynx, had been accepting of her. The New York Liberty, her prior team, had a less positive reaction. She felt like the organization didn't like when her wife Kyleen met her by the team bus, and the coach had discouraged her from discussing it within the organization or publicly. Van Gorp said, It was actually a big issue, and a big part of why the game of basketball aside, I didn't like being in New York. Both of these stories demonstrate some of the big differences between men's and women's sports when it comes to their relationship to queerness. For Van Gorp and Wicks, coming out was a casual affair, despite the complete lack of openly gay players in men's pro leagues at the time. Among players, both seemed to find casual acceptance of their same-sex relationships, even when those in charge of the league's marketing might have felt differently. While the league tried to push back against the stereotype that all women athletes are lesbians, those same stereotypes made it an absolute non-event when WNBA players began to come out. Even while society-wide discussions of homosexuality in the closet were as loud as they'd ever been, women athletes coming out stories didn't really disrupt expectations about gender and sexuality. Even to conservatives who might object to public figures coming out, a WNBA player doing it just confirmed suspicions that those who break gender norms are sexually suspect. In its relationship to queerness, the early WNBA found itself negotiating the pull of two strong forces, the presumption of homosexuality for female athletes and the general presumption of heterosexuality for everyone else. Organizationally, the W often used the latter to counter the former. They put forward traditionally attractive and heterosexual women as the face of the league, especially mothers, who by virtue of reproducing with a man proved their hetero bona fides. But from the beginning of the league, this performance of heterosexuality was undermined by the presence of lesbians in the league and the fandom. Reality has a way of creeping back in. More broadly, the formation of the league was an act of gender rebellion, an assertion that women could expand what it means to be women by excelling in a field like sports, long associated with the performance of a very specific type of masculinity. Pioneer Sue Wicks described it well. There's just that undercurrent of social activism that's built into the pie with women's sports. 
because we are constantly fighting to do this, and there's no two ways about it. It's only since the 70s that it's been a trend to be able to be an athlete, and even then, you had to do it like a lady. There's an activism to this, just to liberate your own human person. The WNBA is a predominantly black league. In 2020, two-thirds of the players in the league were black. It might seem a little surprising then that the first two players to come out were both white women. Wix and Van Gorp coming out created new cracks in the WNBA's glass closet. But the entire narrative about coming out is one that builds in privileged assumptions about race, class, and social position. In a piece discussing Cheryl Swoop's 2005 announcement that she was in a relationship with a woman, a topic to which we will return soon, sociologist Samantha King described coming from a theoretical and political perspective that recognizes the closet and coming out as culturally specific, racially and economically inflected discourses that both enable and constrain the transformative potential of queer politics. The closet is a way of expressing and regulating subjectivity that often operates quite differently for economically marginalized or racialized subjects than it does for the privileged, although such differences are denied by the universalizing way in which it is deployed. Coming out to straight audiences when one does not have the same access to the economic and cultural safety nets that exist for many white and middle-class lesbians and gays may compromise the liberatory potential of this particular act. But coming out into bourgeois, white, and often racist lesbian and gay communities has also not always been possible or desirable. And this is where we'll be headed in part two of the queer history of the WNBA, Cheryl Swoop's 2005 coming out press conference. Swoops differed from Wicks and Van Gorp in two key ways. First, she was black. And secondly, prior to coming out, she was exactly the kind of face that the league sought. Beautiful, feminine, a mother. So when Swoops came out, the reaction was much stronger. How would the W and the culture of American sports deal with this harder to parse performance of gender and sexuality? See you next time. <laughs>